Hey there, welcome to Blockhead, the podcast where cartoonists talk comics and just about everything else. My name is Jeff Grogan, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so in a series of conversations with comics creators about their lives, their work, and comics. So sit back and enjoy. Welcome to Blockhead and our first episode of 2024, hopefully the first of a number of episodes for this year. I'm really hoping to get back on schedule as I've been off doing other things for the last couple of years. I've been very busy, but uh, Blockhead has sort of fallen by the wayside, not not for any lack of, of desire. Uh, it's just too many other things in the way uh, this last past year, and I think I told you a little bit about that the last episode I did, which was... Uh, at the end of 2023, and uh, farewell to that year. Hopefully 2024 is going to be better. I don't know. We'll find out in November, I suppose, uh, what what 2024 portends. Anyway, uh, today here in February, February, just after Valentine's Day in February, I sat down to have a conversation with an old buddy, great cartoonist by the name of Lance Hansen. And if you don't know Lance, uh, check out LanceHansenIllustration.com, first of all. Uh, You're going to find some wonderful cartoons there. Really interesting stuff that is not your typical, um, not typical subject matter, really. I mean, Lance has a a very idiosyncratic um, direction if you will. I think you'll enjoy it. What we're celebrating now is his new book is called Limerature 101, which is literary classics in five lines or less with pictures. And this is a series of limericks um, summarizing (laughs) the entire history of English literature in five lines. Uh, It's a really hilarious, hilarious fun read, and I highly recommend it. Limerature 101 by Lance Hansen. That's H-A-N- S-E-N, and you can get it on Amazon. It's published by the Weekly Humorist and Humorist Books, so you can find it at uh, humoristbooks.com as well if you're not not want to go to, to Amazon for your ordering. Uh, but Lance is a great guy, and I met Lance many years ago. Uh, at we, we were trying to figure it out, whether it was uh, Small Press Expo, SPX, um, or it was Mocha back in the day when... I could get into those things. Um, Such as it is nowadays, I can't get into anything. Uh, You know, you're on the waiting list. Um, I guess I'm just, well, it's a good question. Whether it's my work or whether I'm just too old, I don't know. Um, But um, nevertheless, it's impossible to get into those shows anymore, for me anyway. Um, Whereas I was there early on when it came to SPX and, and Mocha too. Uh, but that's neither here nor there, or maybe it's everywhere. Uh, some of you may know that same frustration. Uh, but nevertheless, that's where Lance and I first hooked up. We had a table. Uh, we're, we were right next to each other. He had a table, and I had a table. And immediately, right from the first moment, I mean, he was an easy person to talk to and, and become friends with. And we did become friends. And I really, right from the first moment, loved the work he was doing. It was, it was uh, just so whimsical, charming, funny, idiosyncratic, literate, all of those things. It was, it, it was all of them. And at the same time, this kind of really hilarious approach to cartooning that I just loved and still just love. And uh, so I'm, I'm so glad that we have a reason, uh, a rationale, to have him here and celebrate his new book, Limerature 101, and to talk about uh, his cartooning in general and where he's going, because he's got some great projects. And there's some great stuff on LanceHansenIllustration.com as well, including a longer piece that is an interview with the, with, um, the son of George Gross, the great German expressionist, uh, painter, cartoonist, uh, anti-fascist, uh, fantastic uh, artist, and uh, his son, I think it's Marty Gross, and um, terrific piece there. And that's just, you know, a hint of what uh, of what kind of work Lance does, which is not run-of-the-mill autobio uh, comics. It's something very, uh, very unique, I think. 
and his interests are are, um, are fairly broad. Uh, and also idiosyncratic. I mean, one of the things he mentions is that he's done a whole series of cartoons about uh, creative people who've committed suicide, and um, uh, not for any intention. It's just that's what happened. So uh, you'll have to listen to the interview to pick up on that. Anyway, uh, this was a lot of fun. It was great to catch up with Lance. He was in, uh, if you're familiar with anything I've done in the past, in 2010, 2011, somewhere around in there, I published uh, with Kevin Much, I published a, uh, a, a newspaper, alternative comics newspaper called Pood, and Lance was an artist in that. So you can see his work there. He's also done work for Mad Magazine, and you may remember his pantomime comic, Mr. Morals, for Mad Magazine. So you may have seen his work there as well. Uh, so he's and, and currently, he's working for the American Bystander, which is not to be confused with the American Spectator, which is a conservative uh, publication. The American Bystander is a humor magazine in the vein of National Lampoon. So uh, look for that. Uh, um, I think it is at AmericanBystander.com. Uh, and uh, it's, as Lance says, it's a quarterly publication. It's pretty cool, and uh, I think I think you'll enjoy it. If you enjoy this interview, you might want to check it out. If you're interested in literate and uh, uh, humor in a um, not in a juggler vein necessarily, but on print anyway. So um, why don't we get right to it, uh, Lance Hansen and myself in conversation. Lance Hansen, welcome to Blockhead. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great, man. It's it's so great to have you here, and uh, it's nice to see you again because we have some, you know, not a great deal of history, but some history. Um, yeah, yeah. Back a number of years. Uh, let's see, where do we first meet? We met at a at a convention, I think. Um, I think it was, I think it was Mocha. It was either Mocha or or SPX, but I think it was Mocha. I think it was Mocha too. I think we were right next to yeah. each other. Uh, <laughs> shared a table space or somewhere around there yeah. yeah i think i think it was right after you had your you got your zero grant i believe oh okay wow For, that uh, was a long time ago jeez man yeah. time has yeah. gone by right i mean that yeah was yeah 2007 or 2008 or something like that yeah mm-hmm. you know? and so a lot has happened since then you were in a couple issues of pood right when we did that I yeah mean, mm-hmm. yeah so back in the in 2010 11 or so so we have some history you've been busy since then uh among the things that you've been busy doing is this wonderful wonderful new book called limerature 101 did i pronounce that correctly yeah that's right yeah Literature, you know. Why don't you, you know, tell folks a little bit about it? I've got a copy here, and I've been, um, frankly, laughing my ass off oh. <laughs> well, as man. I go through it and read it. Uh, you know, it's it's like this is a book. Who folks who don't know, this is a book that really condenses <laughs> the history of English literature into a series of limericks. Uh, more or less, um, for the overly busy student of the 21st century, uh, <laughs> and and quite wittily too, I must say. Um, so you know, how where did this book come from, man? Where did where did uh, you know the first one I I did? I don't know. I just I thought of the idea of doing the metamorphosis, you know, um, and I thought of uh, Gregor, and then I thought of uh, Six Legger, you know, and then. <laughs> <laughs> that was where it started and then i just went from there and then uh you know then i i started doing it a lot while i was at work just trying to you know keep my mind occupied while i was doing something that was kind of maybe a little boring and uh so i started doing that and i started and then i started trying to write like when i got serious i, I think i wrote well i submitted that one to uh michael gerber at uh the american bystander and he liked it and he said hey can you write like four more of these or three more or something and i wrote like 10 more or something you know and then he whittled it down uh to i think he put i think he put four in into the next issue and then i said well maybe i should keep doing this and then i started then i was like well maybe i'll do another thing and try to get it in the in the bystander and i said i'll do all like epic poems because that'll be like the ultimate joke because it's an epic poem reduced down to a limerick and then um but nobody wanted to publish that 
you know, uh, just by itself. I sent it to a couple other places. And then um, then I said, well, let me just try and do a book. So I just started writing them and I kind of challenged myself to try to do like at least two a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then next thing I knew, I had like uh, 70 of them. So, uh, you know, and I sent them to uh, a friend of mine. Well, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Marty Dundeeks. He uh, he runs uh, the, the the Weekly Humorist. Uh, I don't know. Site. Yeah, it's a humor site. Uh, but he had also started up this uh, like imprint, you know, uh, called Humorous Books. And they put out a bunch of books already. Um, so I sent it to him and he liked it a lot. And then, you know, me and him and the, the designer, the book designer, um, kind of, uh, or the editor, actually. Uh, I guess Marty's the book designer. and He's the, the other guy. Uh, Brian Boone is the editor. Um, and Brian Boone actually is the one who kind of came up with the idea for the syllabus and, uh, divided the, you know, uh, he, we didn't want to just have, you know, so there's like different, there's four, uh, quarters, you know, it's like semesters, four semesters, right. um, you know, and so he designed it and set it up like a real syllabus and, you know, it, uh, so it came out, I was pretty happy with it. And then, and then that's also the first time I started drawing in that kind of way those portraits are kind of drawn in a different style than what i usually draw in but mm -hmm. uh, i had fun doing them so well I, I yeah it's the funniest thing I, when i opened up the book and saw the illustrations i was taken aback because i expected uh your usual approach which is uh saturated in in you know cartoonness you know right um, yeah. Right. And and so uh, these kind of nat more or less naturalistic approaches to drawing was a real surprise was that I mean, had you been out of touch with that kind of drawing for a long time? Was it? You know, I, I never really drew that way before. Uh, like even I've always drawn more cartoony. I mean, I guess there were times when I drew a little more serious when I was a little younger. But like, um, uh, you know, I never really did portraits before, except for caricature type things. Um, when I first started doing it, I was trying to do a cartoon for each one. Yeah, um, I just couldn't get like, but I mean, like a cartoon of the scenario, like uh -huh. to go along with each one. And I just couldn't I couldn't do it for all of them. I, you know, I did a couple of them. That I just didn't think they were that even the ones I did, I didn't really like. And then I just just drew. I think I drew the uh, Ernest Hemingway one first. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, kind of like that, you know, so then I just decided to do, do them all like that. Uh -huh. And then, you know, and I tried to do them all at the age approximately the age that they were when they wrote whatever book is in the book you know mm -hmm. yeah well it's it that's interesting i didn't really notice that um or hadn't picked up on that what is interesting when you say it is that most of these authors are fairly young when they've written their their best known works at least it seems that way in in the illustrations yeah yeah yeah, yeah. a lot of them yeah wow it doesn't speak well for aging <laughs> <laughs> Does it? Oh no! Oh, well, you know, there's a lot, uh, but, but a lot of people were like, "Oh, you didn't make uh, Kurt Vonnegut's hair curly enough," and or or uh, you know, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, I I don't remember her ever looking like that, but you know, I I base it on you know earlier pictures of them and stuff. Sure, uh, but uh, well, if you're trying to get to you know draw them the age they were when they wrote right. the book, um, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, it's it's true. I haven't found Joyce Carol Oates. I'm I've only I, when I think of Joyce Carol Carol Oates, I think of the glasses and I think of the curly hair, and I don't think I've ever seen her any other way. Um, yeah, she was um kind of uh, you know a babe or something. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, we have our moments, right? Um, yeah. So so what's fun? Part of what's fun about this book is getting back into the. You forget how to read a limerick. There's like a rhythm to a, a reading a limerick, you know? Right, right, yeah. And for these to really, like at first when I was reading them, I was reading them more like traditional poetry and I wasn't getting, like the humor wasn't hitting me. And then I, I fell into one that was really overtly limerick-like and I can't remember yeah. what it was. And it got me into the whole rhythm of speaking. Yeah. In it might have been the, um, the, the Moby Dick one because that is like starts with, uh, a peg legged salt from Nantucket. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, you know, so that that one, when I did that one, I, you know, that that one might have, you know, yeah, thrust you back into. The <laughs>
<laughs> so you know in a moment maybe we'll read a couple of them because i think people would okay. love to hear uh some of them but the book is organized um as you said there's a syllabus in the beginning and one of the things that i really loved actually was the introduction where you actually lay out you know one of the rationales for the books comic rationales but nevertheless you know i work in a university i'm in a, I'm, I'm a university um professor and so you know, to me, this is near and dear to my heart. You know, the the what do you call it? The evolution of education, of you know, upper level education over the course of many years. The differences between, say, when you and I went to school and uh, and and what's happening now. You know, social media, uh, the rise of of the internet and instant communication, and all the things, the resources that we have at our hand now, just make it so easy and challenging at the same time if you know what i mean yeah i i teach an illustration class and one of the, the things we're talking about is reference material and you know i remember images of john romita or joe kubert with filing cabinets were huge and i used to have boxes of photographs right right refer to you know for for uh, illustrations and and these guys today they don't they're they look at you like are you out of your mind you just google it. <laughs> and guys and, are, the guy's a hoarder yeah, right. I know. And so, you know, at the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, the temptation to take the the photograph or reference material and just, you know, trace it or whatever. Or now we've got AI and all of that is so yeah. good that in some ways they're not engaging or they're tempted at least not to engage the process in the same way. So, yeah. Really, or the reference is like the most obvious one, you know, like that's yeah, why it's, yeah. it's the first Google Check, right. you know thing that comes up you know yeah you said go you know dig deeper and and right. it's easy and too expedient right to grab right. The first reference and uh and a lot of times they're working you know quickly because they've got a number of classes and uh because they never put enough effort in anyway <laughs> you know <laughs> but but you know it says like it says here it talks about um the number of bachelor degrees awarded in english which between 2012 2019 fell by 26 percent and then it goes on philosophy and religion by 25%, foreign languages and literature by 24%. And this is a quote from uh, Louis Menand in The New Yorker. Um, and then it, it reads, in a bid to remedy this development, several institutions have adjusted their course structure to significantly reduce the workload. <laughs> this trend is reflected in the latest addition to the core curriculum of a nearby college, whereas a means of lightening the burden on today's busy student, all literature has been condensed. And thus we have this book in front of us, <laughs> which, I mean, it speaks to a larger issue and the issue which I was just referring to. Um, is that something that you've experienced or seen? Uh, that, uh, well, I'm going to be honest. No, I just, I wrote the limericks and then I said, well, I got to <laughs> figure out, I got to figure out some way to, I got to have some kind of, just story behind this <laughs> it's some yeah. kind of justification for these things so. <laughs> it's, it's just it's it's a concern you know i mean because it really is true i i don't, I don't know about you well growing up i had so much more time to read and yeah to read you know long novels and things and i love reading i absolutely love yeah. it but i've got books that i bought a year and a half ago that i've started and not been able to get through uh. this all of these different things yeah, well, you know, I, I had two kids in the last seven years, so right. the, the reading is uh, reading is totally out the window, you know. <laughs> sure, because it yeah. requires reading and going to the movies, and uh, you know, you know, art is doing art is real tough too. <laughs> yeah, well, finding time for yourself, right in the middle. Yeah, of, for sure, uh, is really difficult because raising kids is what it is. It's everything, yeah. right? and it takes priority over everything. Yeah, so this book is for parents who uh, who miss reading, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they get a catch little, up. It's like the Cliff's Notes on the Cliff's Notes yeah. on the Cliff's Notes. But a heck of a lot more fun. <laughs> okay, so here's the, the next question is, did you have to go back and reread or have you read? Absolutely. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. There's a, I don't, I, you know, the little trade secret is I, you know, I'm 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 almost I'm almost I'm probably as bad as some of your students in terms. Of, I there's a lot of those books I didn't read, so I just uh, went and sort of tried it. But I try. I, I think I did a good job of making it. I'm not going to tell you which ones I have and haven't read, but no, um, there's know. several. I think I I did a pretty good job of uh, making them 
at least making it seem like I'm like I'm well read. You know, that was really that was really the main thing. I just uh, I'm kind of like um, I turned to this like uh, started writing this book for the same reason that Zelig became the human chameleon. You know, uh, somebody asked me if I uh, I think what isn't that, somebody asked him if he read Moby Dick and then he uh, became this. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> so that's kind of why I, that's kind of why i wrote this book same same thing well it, it you know it certainly i picked it up and i was like whoa man lance has read so much <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea <laughs> and i was like whoa you know i and and you know i felt really inferior <laughs> well don't don't <laughs> well now now you can pick it up and say wow lance wrote a book of limericks like With, oh <laughs> no, no, we, uh, all the it doesn't matter because they're you know you've caught the gist of so many of them and and i i'm sure that you have read a good many of them you do thank your your uh, english teachers from junior high school yes uh, yeah you know, yeah but there's some that are particularly wonderful and um well a lot of them that are wonderful but books that i read that i've come across for example you know, i've just opened up to uh, uh the world according to garp which was a big book to me when i was 20 21 years old that one I have read. Yeah, that's a great book. I love that's that book. a great. I love John Irving. He's he, yeah. You know, I've got a bunch of another again. I've got a bunch of his books that I haven't read. For right. Book, for a while there, I was I was reading pretty much everything he put out for a couple yeah. of years there. Um, and I think you really caught this one really, <laughs> really well. Do you mind if I read this? No, of course. Okay, so the world according to Garp. Okay, so let's see if I can get the rhythm. Sweet story about a nurse and her son and some ladies who lop off their tongues. There's rape, assassination, some literal castration, and a bear, of course, thrown in for fun. <laughs> well, the, you know, he's always got the bears oh, in the, in the books for some reason. A little bit weird and, you know, a little eccentric in in uh, John Irving's. Yeah. I read, let's see, The Hotel New Hampshire, where he mm -hmm. sort of takes the bear motif a little bit farther. Um, right, right. It's like a girl in a bear costume or something, who not it? I right? actually, you know, honestly, I don't recall. It had to do with a, a family who ran a hotel. Uh, yeah. Not in New Hampshire, though. Um, and there was a bear, and I thought it was a real bear. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe. Um, I think that, they, yeah, I think I, I maybe in the movie there's a bear suit. I don't know. I saw the movie, too. Oh, was so, there a yeah. movie of that book? Because I never saw yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was done by that guy, uh the guy who did like the loved one, um, what was his name? Tony Richardson. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah. It's pretty weird. It's got like, uh, Bo Bridges and Jodie Foster and Rob Lowe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, I did see the world according to Garp a number of times, which I liked, but you know, the book is so much better. It's so, it's so different. Uh, but you know, I like the movie. I, I saw the movie before I read the book, but, uh, then there's that, um, it's it's like the most different but i mean it still has a lot of the same stuff in it but it's so different from the book and while still getting a lot of the but there's also like things in it that just aren't in the book you know like mm -hmm. kind of like his whole like he in the movie he's like you know always thinking about his dad and flying mm -hmm. and stuff and and then the book it's not even he doesn't even and then but i did like in the movie how they um dealt with the ellen james character uh i kind of liked it better than how it dealt with it in the book mm -hmm. uh, that's the girl who gets her tongue cut out yes yeah yeah anyway i thought it was a but i, I liked how they did that in the in the movie versus the book but I, I i would agree with you that the um the book is better oh yeah well and i guess that's the case most of the time um yeah it, you know um i i remember seeing dr Zhivago. i've seen it many times uh and i love the movie but the movie is a very different experience from the book which yeah the, just you know poetry it's so beautiful um yeah but anyway uh so do you have favorites in here that you would like to read for us oh um sh sure all right well i think my favorite is the unbearable lightness of being uh by uh Dylan kandara if i'm pronouncing that right um the unbearable lightness of being a handsome young surgeon from prague adrift in a philanderous fog between a girl and a bowler and his wife a bipolar who spends most of her time with a dog <laughs> I think that's my best one. <laughs> oh, you know, I also like this one. I'm going to uh, see if I can find this. Okay, this one. They shoot horses, don't they? Okay. A failed ingenue name of Gloria to her dance partner, not just to worry you. 
pulls a gun from her purse. After hoofing and worse, I've come down with a touch of dysphoria. <laughs> so limericks are four lines. Is that is that it? It's got to be four lines? Uh, they're five. Five, five lines. So it's, okay, five it's like lines. it's A, A, B, B, A is the, the rhyme scheme. Uh -huh. And did that was, was that something you had to think about? A, a lot of uh, fell into it once you got started no yeah I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the whole you know i, I you know I, i've written i think the first limerick i ever wrote was this one that went uh which is not published anywhere because it's just stupid but um it's uh was it um there was a young man from angola who was questioned while sipping his cola do you prefer Pepsi or Coke? He replied, what a joke. I can't even tell shit from Shinola. You know, it's just <laughs> really stupid. Okay. So this is something you've you've been doing for a long time. You're, yeah. You're oh, my first published limerick was this. It's called The First Sons. And it was about the Trump sons, you know, okay. Donald Trump's sons. And it said, um, the minds of these first sons should certainly worry us. Their psyche is so fragile and, and feeble and furious. And I think were an analyst ever to probe, it is likely he'd find a Leopold and a Loeb, though much less, much much less intellectually curious. Oh my God, I'm sorry, I I, I botched it, but you know that's the okay. gist. It was good. It was good. <laughs> you know, I have I have I'm speaking of his sons. I have this premonition that his vice presidential pick is going to be one of his kids. Oh God, a nightmare. I, like, I, it's a nightmare. But I, I I you know just think about it. You're him. You want to make sure that when you you're elected, you don't have to leave ever. And right. last time Pence was, you know, did the the right thing, and now you got to have somebody in there who's not going to right, right, constitution, right. right? So, right. Well, who's going to be loyal? Your kid, you know. Right. So, yeah, um, ugh, it's scary. It's really scary. Uh, well, anyway off topic but um okay so this was a really important book to me when i was younger the sun also rises uh mm -hmm. with hemingway I, I read this book about 50 times i took a course in hemingway and fitzgerald uh when i was in art school which i enjoyed a lot and um uh so i've become a over time a hemingway aficionado Jake, an impotent scribe, travels with his bohe bohemian tribe and a hip divorcee who's a matador's bay Cue the fisticuffs once they imbibe. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> a matador's bay. Now I've never used that word before. B A E. What what is yeah. that? It's like baby. You know, it's baby. like a yeah. Okay, it's but like it's a not... contemporary contemporary nomenclature. Oh, okay, for, uh, mean squeeze or something. So, and then we've got okay. Here's another good one. Uh, let's see, um, Huckleberry Finn having faked his own death, a young knave sets adrift with a runaway slave. On this picturesque quest, he meets up with his bestie, a boy who's not wont to behave. <laughs> I think that's great. And we've all read oh, that. Th thank you. Yeah, that one's a great one. It's terrific. There's so many of these. There's so, there's so much fun. Um, and I really, you know, you get a kick out of all of them. And the books you maybe haven't read, it makes you want to go read. So um, that's cool too. But it, it, it should be, also work is kind of embarrassment to anybody who's not, you know, kept up with their reading because <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, Oh man, there's so many books that I haven't, I haven't right. checked. And some that are kind of surprising, like a Confederacy of Dunces. That's kind of, is it, now that book is the reputation of that book has gone. Uh, I mean, the interesting story, I guess for years, the guy couldn't, couldn't get it printed, right. He couldn't get right. it. And he ultimately, because of it, he, I don't know whether just because of that, but I always heard the story. It was because he couldn't get it published and couldn't become a published author. He killed himself. Yeah. Like, you know? Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think there were probably, he had, you know, I, I think he had schizophrenia, but I don't know what brought that on. You know, he really went off the deep end, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. And literally um, you've done, I mean, you sent me the other day, you sent me a cartoon, I think, um, John Kennedy tool, right? Um, yeah. 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 It's all about, but it's specifically about his downward spiral. I yeah. didn't want to get too much into the, because, you know, whenever you read about him, the big thing that they always, like, in, if you buy the book, you know, they have a whole, always have a big introduction where it's about, um, you know, his mother bringing mm -hmm. it to, like, Walker Percy, or, you know, and um, so I've, you know, I've read that a bunch of times, and um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I kind of wanted to, when I was reading about him, I didn't know 
like I knew he killed himself, but I didn't know he actually sort of like went insane, yeah, you know? So I, um, I kind of wanted to do a kind of humor, uh, you know, it's, I do it in kind of a humorous way, but um, so, I mean, it's also pretty sad, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's very sad. Again, that's another book I read like 40 years ago, so I barely remember it. The, the one thing I remember about it was laughing my butt off. Um, oh, my God. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's so absolutely good. It's hilarious. It's so funny. And um, and then you read it and you realize one book, you know, and, and I guess he killed himself before the book was published. Yeah, um, yeah. It wasn't published until like 10 years after he yeah. killed himself or something like that. It was published in the 80s, and I think he killed himself in the... In the, in the 60s, 70s, early 70s, 70s I believe. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I think he killed himself in 69, actually. Yeah, I think it was 69. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Because that's, you've got um, in the comic that you drew, John Kennedy, yeah. 61 to 69, he's at Flannery O'Connor's house and um, he parks and, you know, puts a, takes the hose and attaches it to the exhaust. And yeah. Is that how? Yeah, he, well, he, I don't think he actually did it in front of her house. I think that I, I, that, little strip is supposed to be like throughout his day so he goes and mails his mother something and then goes oh, okay. of Flannery. but you know but he went to her house you mm -hmm. know just to um i don't know i guess he was a big fan yeah. uh but uh you know wow it's 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 yeah the way you've done i mean folks who haven't seen where was this cartoon published was it in the bystander yeah yeah that was in the bystander yeah. this is a beautiful cartoon um for folks who don't know Lance, how would you describe your style? I mean, where's it? You, you, and I'm not talking about the the portraits in literature now. I'm talking about your usual approach to to cartooning. Um, it's 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 both reminiscent of of styles that I know from I don't know from where. Uh, they're like embedded, you know, deeply in your consciousness. At the same time, it's incredible. It's totally unique. So I would know it was your work anywhere I saw it. Well, oh, thank you. Yeah, it was, it's always been that way. That's one of the reasons, you know, right from the start, the first time I met you, I was looking at the work and I was like, this stuff is great. I've never, it, you know, there are cartoons who remind me of this, but I've never really seen anything quite exactly like it. It's just, it's your voice, you know? So oh, thank you. what were your, where did it come from? How would you describe it first? And then hmm. what are your inspiration? Well, how would I describe it? It's kind of hard to, I don't know. I don't even know. Yeah, it's cartoony. Uh, I, I think it'd be easier to describe some of my influences. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't, um, you know, as a kid, I read Mad Magazine, obviously mm -hmm. uh, that was a big thing. And, you know, so all those guys, and you know, I don't know. Something happened when I was, um, I put out a book called Don't Cry. I got the zero grant for that. Uh, that was a long time ago. And that was drawn in a more, serious style and um that was kind of how i was drawing a lot of stuff and then um i mean honestly what happened was i got uh, an issue of you know i had always really liked ivan brunetti's work oh know, yeah uh, and then he came out with the fourth issue of um schizo and it had a huge impact on on me um and i decided to start drawing things in a little more of a elastic kind of quality you know what i mean um and then after I, you know, af after that, the next book I put out was called Hayseed and it was all pantomime. Oh, yeah. So then I started like really getting into that idea of, you know, expressing whatever through just body language and, and facial expressions and stuff like that. Uh, and um, then I, you know, if you do that pantomime stuff, the, the, the first stuff I ever got into Mad Magazine actually like most of the stuff i got into mad magazine was all pantomime also it was a character called uh, mr morals um who was sort of a you know like a rick santorum type uh but you know not a politician just some kind of like uh religious hypocrite in my view um mm -hmm. so uh yeah and i started i did all those in panama and you work in pantomime for for long enough you start to go crazy so uh <laughs> I, that's when i started uh you know doing more written stuff uh so then i i think the next big thing i did was i did this interview with uh, a guy named marty gross um who's a jazz musician and his father he's you know uh, in his 90s but uh his father was george gross 
mm-hmm. the German painter. So I, I, I met him and I interviewed him and I did a comic based on that, but with words. So it was sort of the first time I used that style with, you know, with more of a word, you know, with words. I, I might've done a couple of things before. I think the stuff I did in Pood, yeah, that had words too. Well, that was in a yeah. similar, um, mm-hmm. similar style. But uh, anyway, yeah, I don't really know how to describe it, but that's kind of where it came from. I mean, it's there's a lot of, you know, Peter Bag was also a big influence on mm-hmm. that, the type of, you know, the stretchy arms and stuff. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I can see it in the arms. Um, yeah, I can see Brunetti too, now that you mentioned Ivan Brunetti. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a, one of the things I love about your stuff, it's, it reaches back, right, to a world of cartooning is, is in some ways that, Brunetti's does um that was eclipsed I think in the 70s maybe in the late 60s um it, it harkens back to some of the styles that were in very popular publications through you know say from the 20s through the 50s um right right that kind of look to it there's a there's a an artful approach to simplification if you will and to notation right so right. that the cartoons feel they're they're very very simple and very straightforward but at the same time they're always they always feel aesthetically considered in in a way whereas if somebody were to draw like say i'm looking at one of your drawings and there's of the kennedy tool comic and there's a chair uh you know where it says john kennedy has died and and uh kennedy tool falls off his chair and the little chair is just this little notation and in the hands of another cartoonist or just somebody who's just drawing that that would look offhand and ill-considered and would not be convincing at all but in your hands and in somebody who's capable of this you know aestheticized simplicity for lack of a better word it's it's absolutely convincing and beautiful and perfectly suited to what you've been doing because the whole package works together. And, and so that's very, very, very nice. Thank you very much. I, it's a great compliment. Well, it's one of the things that I've always loved about your work is that, is that intellectually, when you look at it, I think, you know, that this is a very capable artist. This is a very well-schooled and thoughtful cartoonist. And that comes across in the in the approach, and it never comes across as offhand or ill considered, or in or you know, as I said, in the hands of somebody else, it would be incompetent. You know, uh, but not it comes across as as being you know a considered approach to um, to comics and to cartooning, and it makes it it communicates all the better for it. You know, um, to me as as a reader, and uh, I've just I've always just loved what you do. Another thing about your work that's distinct to me is that your subject matter is always erudite. It's always, it's always literate. It's, it's um, thoughtful. It's not just sort of run of the mill slapstick stuff. You're always dealing with subjects that are um, like Kennedy tool or Phil Oaks, as you've done in these other strips that are interesting offbeat, but also they're, categories they're subjects that not everybody wants to get into right so, well yeah yeah what is it that draws you to a particular subject i don't know i mean these ones have all been about guys who killed themselves so i yeah. don't know what's going on with that that's uh that's just I, i've got to stop um right after my freddie prince one i'm just kidding <laughs> i'm not doing a freddie prince one but i am doing a, my next one that i kind of have mapped out is a, a one about Joe Meek, who's the the British record producer, but he did kill himself too. But I'm not going to do any more about uh, people killing themselves after that after, one. After, <laughs> after Joe Meek, yeah. Oh my gosh! Well, now this scene, now there's a character I have no idea who that is. Um, who did he produce? Oh, you know he. Well, he did that. You know that song Telstar. You know. Yes. Um, oh, I love yeah. it. Yeah, that's that. He he produced that and like wrote it, like the the music. You know. Oh my god. Yeah, he, he, was, he was he was really crazy. He thought that uh, Phil Spector was uh, like spying on him through astral pro- projection, and he, he thought that the ghost of Buddy Holly would visit him, and that they were like linked. And uh, you know, he was obsessed with Buddy Holly, and then he like uh, what else? Just all kinds. Of, he was like uh, he only went out in sunglasses because he was afraid the Craze brothers would um, you know find him and 
kill him or or that they would like extort money from him because he was a homosexual and uh yeah very uh a lot of lot of a lot of crazy stuff and he thought his house was filled with poltergeists and then he killed his landlord and then killed himself and he killed himself on the date the same date that buddy holly died i forget oh what it was February, like february 7th so yeah he always he always would see buddy holly come into his flat and like talk to him in like but not he wouldn't know what he was saying yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. He was not. <laughs> was this a guy who you had just been interested in on your own? Uh, clue you into? Yeah, him? you know, I don't know. I was, you know, I had done the Phil Oaks one, and then I well, first I did the John Kennedy two, and then I sent a thing out to some friends of mine, and I said, hey, wh- wh- where's who are some other people that would be, you know, weird mm-hmm. and cool. And a friend of mine named EJ sent, he said, you should do Joe Meek. And I was like, oh, that'd be perfect. You know, and then, and then reading, I mean, I was familiar with him because of Telstar, but, um, and then another one that I might do uh, is uh, Joe Orton, you know, the, um, the playwright. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, but I'm, I'm kind of trying to co- come up with a bunch for, um, I'm, my plan is to have one in, in every issue of the, uh, the bystander, I, you know, but, We'll see how long I can keep it up, you know. Well, certainly that's a fascinating story. I mean, if it's not, I mean, and it's ideal for what you're doing and how you're doing it in in these comic strips, which are you know wonderful. And um, what's the what's the word for the approach to humor that here? It's very low key uh, and and gentle. I mean, at the same time, there are moments that are like really harsh and powerful, like the end of the Kennedy O'Toole piece where we just see the the car and the car is so small and in the distance and so seemingly insignificant but at the same time so powerful and the same thing is true in the oaks one not to give that away but you also end it in a similar way where you're not i mean the work is all the more powerful for being oblique if you will rather than direct in its reference to you know the the ultimate end yeah well you know i that one i did have to think about a lot because, you know, I was like, I don't want to just have, like, his legs, you know, hanging from the top, you know, like, yeah, so. So how did the work in The Bystander come about? How did the, so you've been working for them how long now? Well, yeah, for a long time. I mean, a couple of years. Uh, I um, I heard about the first issue before it came out because, you know, it was a Kickstarter thing. And uh, at the time, I was doing a lot of writing with this uh, guy named Kit Lively, who's a we're a writer for Mad. We were doing a lot of stuff to pitch to Mad specifically, mm-hmm. and he brought it to my attention because uh, he's you know always on top of all that kind of stuff. And um, and then uh, you know I started writing to Michael uh, right away and submitting stuff and got you know quite a few uh, you know rejections and then and then I think the first thing I sent into him was that I got I think the first drawing I sent into him that got published was a. Uh, a picture of Donald Trump dressed up as the uh, Mata Hari and it, um, it was called Maga Hari. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then he started saying, Hey, do you want to do an illustration? And you know, this, that, and the other. And then, and then out of the blue last year, he was like, uh, Hey, do you want to do the cover? Which was great. You know? So I did cover to issue 25 and then, and then he asked me to be a uh, staff artist. So I'm pretty much in, you know, at least one, page but uh per per issue mm-hmm. um now so that's going great you know I'm yeah. very happy with that i mean there's a lot of really excellent uh talent involved in that magazine uh, you know writers and uh and artists you know um just i mean the cover artists are i mean up until 25 are like uh you know totally stellar you know it's like um drew friedman and uh you know uh uh Arnold Ross is, you know, um, just, you know, a million, yeah, you know, huge. So it was very shocking when he asked me to do it. I was like, well, you know, um, so, uh, I saw that cover and I thought it looked terrific and it gives it, um, again, it's got this New Yorker feel to it. Oh, your, your cartooning is of that era too. It's of that school that always seems to be, I mean, it's perfectly placed really. I love oh, it. Thank so you. Thank great. you. Thank you. Um, so you're working as staff artist. That's great. Is there are there other duties besides? No, it's just he'll just say, "Hey, do you." Well, 
he he basically said, you know, just I mean, I he's not like giving me carte blanche or anything, but you know, the idea is, you know, I try to get a strip in every every issue. You know, the last issue, I think I fell a little behind, but I did get an illustration. You know, he asked me to do an illustration. So, um, but you know, he also asked me to do the like the back page ad uh, mm -hmm. for the that was in the gonna it's gonna run in the next ten. I think mm -hmm. um, issues. So, uh, so that's for the back cover. You know, it's for like back issues and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Sure. So little things like that. Yeah, he'll give me little assignments or, or or what have you. Now, prior to that, you were talking about Mad Magazine, and how long did you work for Mad, and wh when did that start? And again, you know, you said you were a fan of Mad, so I'm imagining that you'd been submitting stuff on and off. <laughs> over yeah, the yeah, yeah. I've been submitting stuff a lot. And then um, what happened was, so I had submitted, yeah, quite a bit, you know, and always been turned down. But, you know, I mean, that's just mm -hmm. to be expected. And then the first thing I got into there was actually a, something I wrote. So I don't know what year it was, but it was for their year end thing. And it was about, it was, you know how they always do Casey at, at the bat. Um, sure. They have like a million of those. And I did a, I did one about Casey Anthony. Um, called Casey at the trial and I submitted it and they they said okay do it you know and then they I, I worked with this great editor um, Charlie Cato and uh, we really tightened it up and and then at the last minute they were like this is actually great though um, they said well we sent it to um, I mean I thought it came out really good to be honest but then they sent it to um, Frank Jacobs who you know is a legendary mm -hmm. uh, writer Mm -hmm. uh, who wrote, you know, a million, you know, song parodies for Mad and stuff. And he basically rewrote it. I mean, there was a few elements, but they um, they said, well, do you, you know, do you still want a byline? And I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, so I, <laughs> I took the byline right on, you know, so it was like Lance Hansen and Frank Jacobs, or it might have said Frank Jacobs and Lance Hansen. Mm -hmm. but, so my first byline was with Frank Jacobs, which was amazing. Then the next thing I got in was a, mis a Mr. Morals and then and then I pitched like 20 more Mr. Morals that didn't get in. And then I got another, I got like, I think I got like seven or eight in by the end. Mm -hmm. And then there were some little written gags that got in here and there and, uh, you know, that I didn't do the art for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a number of years and you worked there pretty much until, or you had stuff published there until pretty much it ended. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. Until they, yeah, they're new, you know, they're still going on, but they're not putting out. I don't, I mean, they may have started to do a little, what they did was they stopped doing, they re, okay, what they did was they did a volume two. Mm -hmm. They moved their offices to the West Coast and basically got a, a new editorial staff. Mm -hmm. And um, so they started at number one. And I think for a while that they, they were, I was still pitching to them, but, um, you know, didn't really make any traction. And then um, they, uh ceased all new material and it just started doing reprints yeah which i think is what they're still doing but i think they are having i know they never stopped doing the fold-in so wow. they have an, a new guy doing the fold-in who's who's great um i think his name is i think it's johnny samson but so i don't think they're doing much new stuff so i haven't even submitted anything to them mm -hmm. in in a long time you know, that, it was kind of a sad thing when that happened. I remember I had Ryan Flanders on the show. Who oh, he's the best. He's yeah, great. Love yeah, that guy. Uh, Ryan's a great guy. And uh, he was on the show for, for, you know, an extended episode. We talked about what was going on with Mad. And um, it, it actually, it turned out to be one of the most popular shows I did, um, that one. But, you know, I mean, it's a huge, I mean, Mad has been so important to so many of us right i mean you know yeah. it's just been it's it's like the benchmark for a whole generation of of satirists and cartoonists oh know? yeah definitely and after that national lampoon i think for for a number of us too yeah uh, but mad magazine is just so crucial and and to, you know it's like so many things that come and go especially something that's been around for 50 some years you just never you take it for granted you never think it's gonna right right appear it's an institution but like democracy <laughs> it needs yeah. to be fed and taken care of and, and right 
it's another phenomenon. You go to the, I think um, a friend on Facebook posted a picture of a grocery store. It was a before and after of like, you know, a couple of months and at all the registers, there were all these magazine racks and then boom uh, in the next photograph from just the last month or so, no magazine racks at all. Yeah. Gone. And it's a sad situation, um, but that's the way of the world, right? You know, yeah. uh, is is disappearing, but at the same time you've got that you have people who are hungry for it and that's why things show up on kickstarter um you know right. your audience that way and and so people will come out for it but perhaps not in the in the numbers that constitute or necessitate mass distribution of the kind that we're used to you know yeah from the great era of magazines you know the 20th century yeah yeah for sure you know so the bystander appears how often is it monthly no no i mean it i think it's usually quarterly i think last year they only put out two but i think it was typically quarterly so it's a print magazine um mm. and where you know where's it distributed to for the most part so people can pick it up i think it's just m- mostly to subscribers Okay. Um, I, I don't know if it's carried in a. It may be carried in, and you can, or you can just buy it online at, through the through the publisher. The, through. I, I don't think it's in. I, it, it may be in some bookstores, but I don't really, you know, know, um, yeah. you know, which bookstores. So it's like AmericanBystander dot com or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You can find it that way, or just Google American Bystander. Um, is that the only place that your work is appearing these days, or is it elsewhere is that, that I'm unaware of? Um, for the most part now, yeah, most of the other stuff is just, uh, stuff that I'm working on for, um, you know, trying to get this book together and well, stuff tell, like that. Yeah. Tell us about, about the book, because you did send me a couple pages and it's a biography of mm-hmm. John Hartfield. Um, John Hartfield. Yeah, that's right. The, the great um, collage artist. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm working on it with his grandson who, um, you know, is great. You know, he's doing most of the writing and, uh, you know, but we're collaborating a great deal on, you know, I'm, I'm doing the art, but, you know, he has a, a lot of input into, you know, what, what the panels will look like and so on and so forth. Um, it's taking a while though, you know, we started it sort of right before the uh, pandemic and, you know, then that kind of, you know, took a little bit of a, a wind out, out of our sails for a while, but we're, we're back on track with it now. Was it just sort of, serendipity that you know that brought you to the subject or was it hartfield story was something that was uh, well you know i was always a big um fan of his stuff even though i felt like it was the type of thing that a lot of people didn't i don't know whenever i would bring it up you know to any of my artist friends they a lot of people just didn't know had never heard of him or just weren't familiar with him Mm -hmm. um so it was kind of interesting. I, I I first heard about him when I was in college in a, uh, in a like a photography class, mm-hmm. and um, that I was kind of just taking for fun, and um, I was really blown away by by his work because <clears throat> it's very satirical. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then what happened was I, I mentioned earlier the George, I, I'm yeah the George Gross Marty Gross interview, um, so that got published. Um, in the bystander, but also on op art, which is um, put out by uh, the the nation uh-huh. uh, magazine, but it's their online, uh, like more, it's like all political art and stuff. Um, so they put that out there. And, um, and then somehow through that, I think uh, that's how me and John, that's the grandson, John Hartfield is also his name. Um, that's how we connected, um, you know, then online. And he lives not too far from where I live. Uh, you know, not, I mean, not really that close, but, you know, uh, he lives kind of close to where I grew up uh, in New Jersey. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I've only met him in person one time. Uh, you know, I drove over there and we met up somewhere. Um, but, you know, we've talked a lot on, you know, on FaceTime and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And so it was through this the gross uh, interview and uh, that he found he was in he became interested in your work through yeah I guess I might have even sent him it because I think at that point I had um, he he was putting a lot of stuff on Facebook and 
I think just Facebook at the time um, for like this John Hartfield gallery that he maintains. <clears throat> uh, it's a website. I think it's called the John Hartfield uh, exhibit um, and um, or exhibition, John Hartfield exhibition. Uh, but he, you know, he maintains that website. So I, you know, then I became friends with him on social mm -hmm. media and sent it to him. And, um, and he said, Hey, we should, do something together you know and then we started talking and at first i was planning on doing more of a short uh thing but then we started talking and uh we said hey this would be a pretty great you know book mm -hmm. so that's how that came about well it's so exciting it really is and and i've got in front of me two pages that you sent me um titled the night they came to murder my grandfather and uh for those for folks who don't know who john hartfield was my knowledge of him is certainly not going to be as, as broad as yours. I know of him as a collage artist who did these extraordinary collages, just beautiful work in the 30s, um, along with other great collage artists like Hannah Hulk, um, German artist who, who did these very, um, you know, pointed anti-fascist, you know, collages uh, that were extraordinary, really incredible, both in their impact and also just you know aesthetically formally they're incredible um, yeah and it's, i mean the, the story of you know because the other thing is he was a pacifist so you know he was completely against violence you know and um but i mean he really put his you know i mean he was definitely i mean he was definitely they definitely wanted him dead <laughs> you, well, know, yeah. it was a, yeah. you know it took a lot of courage to uh certainly to uh i mean a lot of those people same with george gross you know Sure. Um, you know, they, uh, well, the night they were, came to murder my grandfather, why don't you tell folks what that, you know, little vignette is about? Um, cause uh, it's just about, uh, this night when, uh, the, uh, I guess they're not at this point. I don't know if they're Nazis. Yeah, no, yeah. They're, I don't know if they're Nazis. Yeah, they're, they are Nazis. Yeah. The Nazis come. Um, I wasn't sure if they were just brown shirts or something, but, um, yeah, the Nazis come and kick in his door and he jumps through his window of his uh, studio and uh, escapes into the night, but he actually just hides in a, you know, tiny garbage can for seven hours as they search for him. And, uh, but he, you know, escaped, uh, you know, so that's, that's what that it's only, it's a two page little story. Yeah. Now it uh, is this um, two page story. Is it a chapter in the book or is it? Yeah. It's actually going to be the opening, of the, the opening book. of the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And then the rest is kind of various other points through throughout his life. And how far along are you? Uh, you know, we're in the rough stages of several chapters. Uh, okay. You know, right now I'm kind of in the, I'm actually in the process of inking one chapter now that is about um, the uh, first international Dadaist fair um, called, it's called a perfect venue. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a real it's a fun chapter um mm -hmm. but uh so that that one and then you know we got other ones you know a lot of stuff about dadaism and uh mm -hmm. there's a lot of characters that you mentioned like you know hannah hoke and, mm -hmm. um stuff like that that show up um is dada and that era has that always been of interest to you or or is it uh... yeah yeah i mean certainly although i i you know i wouldn't say that i'm you know, before starting this, I, you know, I wouldn't say that I was in any way an expert, but I, uh, you know, well, I'm still not an expert, but, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot about it now, but I was always fascinated by it, you know, in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a lot of, I mean, it's a fantastic period in art history. It's always been of great interest to me too. Um, you know, just, a, just an interesting approach, but one of the things that, um, strikes me in this story is in the night they came to murder my grandfather is not to be too dramatic but at the same time this is what happens people don't they don't realize the threat of fascism and the threat of of violence or repression the repression of dissent right mm -hmm. is very is a very real occurrence yeah. and and it can happen anywhere and when you're in a place that is no longer that it takes it for granted uh that it'll always be there that the freedom to speak freely will always be there and whatnot yeah 
um, it's it's really easy to to lose sight of and and find yourself um, in a similar situation. You know, it's a hard field where politicians come to power who are interested in nothing else but maintaining power, and they do so by crushing dissent. And Hartfield is an example of that. Yeah. You know. And, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons we, you know, want to do the do the book because of the current state of the world. Yeah, the uh, world. It's kind of a kind of an evergreen. Unfortunately, it's an evergreen uh, subject matter yeah. uh, these days. And um, so, you know, I heard a, a, a I was listening to a friend had a book come out and he was on a talk show on a radio station I never listened to. It's a relatively local radio station. And it, as most local radio stations here tend to be, it tends to lean conservative. And, I, and this is one of the reasons I never listened to it. Sure. He was describing Putin as a non-traditional leader, the, a man who is in the right place at the right time. And I, I can't get over that description of Putin. I just can't get past <laughs> non-traditional. Like, no, he's very traditional. <laughs> right. He's a traditional <laughs> dictator, you know. Right, right, right. Call him what he is. But no. And I, I thought to myself, if is this how they're rationalizing fidelity to um, Putin and, and his agenda? Um, it's it that kind of twisting of verbiage, you know, the the playing with language is another strategy, you know, for right. complicity in acts that you would never be complicit in previously. Right, right. Finding a way to rationalize it through language, and um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just still like it dumbfounds me. I can't get over it, and this is kind of okay. So that means that. Trump is a non-traditional leader. Is that what he is? Right. <laughs> right. Okay, that sounds like a justification to me. And uh, right, right. Anyway, it's unfathomable, and yet here we are. Yeah. Uh, but so, where do you have a date in mind for the completion of this book? Because oh, yeah. oh, no, I don't know. To... Don't put me on the spot. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I'd like to get it all done within this year. That's yeah. when I'd like to have it done. Yeah. Or at least, you know, done enough to start pitching it around. Yeah. You know? yeah. And if you can't, will you do a Kickstarter? Yeah. I mean, that's see the problem. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll let, I don't know. I, I just don't think I'd be good at a Kickstarter personally. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, um, I don't know. What goes, I know you have to do a lot of work <laughs> with the Kickstarter. Like you got to like give people stuff. And I don't know. Yeah, I it's a lot of work. It's, yeah. It's a lot of work. But it's also, I found it very gratifying. Um, yeah. I really do find it gratifying. It's about the only way I get my work out there anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's via Kickstarter. And um, as small as what I would, I wouldn't call it my fan base, but people who are, who follow my work, it's very small, but it, it's nice um, in the sense that I'm not going to make a living from this, you know? <laughs> but, right, right. But there are people who actively, okay, I liked what you did last time. I'm going to follow this time. Well, that that's satisfying to me, you know? To, yeah. To, so there's there's a, a lot to be said for it. It is a lot of work, but once you've done a couple of them, you know what to do. You know the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think I can't see this book not finding a home. I mean, I think it's it's a terrific subject. I think you know graphically what you're doing is is terrific, and uh, I think it's gonna it's it's a book that needs to be out there, particularly now. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the idea. Well, the other good thing is you know because you know we, I mean. John's involvement, you know, he's he has the right to his grandfather's art. You know what I mean? Like he can he can reproduce it in the oh, book. Which is, yeah, yeah, which is nice. That is nice. That that's going to make it all the more, you know, uh, for those people who are art lovers, those people who are aficionados of Dada and of uh, Hartfield's collage. Anybody who's interested in collage, you know, Hartfield is one of the one of those foundational figures. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I don't know if you remember the stuff I did for Pood. Um, right, right, yeah, a lot of collage work. I was really into it, and I still have this dream of doing, getting back to doing it because I love the process. It's a totally different process. Um, yeah, and, and I've got this oversized book in my head that I want to do. Um, yeah, you know, collage work. I just, I love it. You know, is it something you've ever? I mean, are you tempted at all? Well, you know, I, I did one for this book. Um, we were thinking about doing like little inserts in between different sections. Um, but instead of just having them written like a little introductions to each section, but we, we said, well, what if we did like Hartfield-esque 
so I did try my hand at it and it came out pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, I was pretty pleased with it. I mean, I haven't ever done anything like that, but it was, it was very gratifying to do. It was a, a lot of, it's a lot of fun, but you're right. It is very different. I can send that to you if you'd like. Oh, I'd to love see to it. You know, yeah. just, uh, yeah. it's a little thing to describe the, um, you know, the beginning of world war one, uh, oh, you cool. know, with, uh, you know, what's his name? Ferdinand. Uh -huh. uh, Archduke uh, Ferdinand. Yeah. yeah Archduke the Ferdinand. Assassination. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, and, you know, other little things are all incorporated into, into it. Oh, I, and I think it. it came out pretty nice. Yeah. It, it's great. And, you know, it is a very different process from the process of, of doing narrative cartooning. Um, yeah. You, you start to get involved in just a different way of thinking. I found, now, are you working, this gets to the other question I had in my mind. Are you working traditionally or are you working digitally these days or both? Both. You know, I do all the inking on i do you know i draw everything in pencil and i do all my inking on tracing paper uh, uh -huh. and then i scan all that and put it in i do color it all in photoshop though yeah yeah so but i do everything at like um 200 percent the size so each panel is like really huge the originals and then i put them together like so an, an 11 by 17 uh image is actually like 22 by 34 i mean every page i do is really huge mm -hmm. uh, but i mean they're not really huge you know because they're just in the computer but the panels are, are huge and then i put them together like that oh so are you doing panels like separately and then sort of yeah yeah photoshop mm -hmm. yeah okay. i so, combine all the panels in photoshop and then so I you're not them. working on a big 22 inch piece of paper no 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 not but at you're all. doing your your panels at a size that's comfortable to work at well then... i draw everything pretty small at first and then i blow it up to whatever size i need it to be for the panels and I do it on 11 by 17, you know, I'll have the panels already on the page and then I'll take each individual panel and cut it out and just blow it up 200%. And then that'll be what I ink. Mm -hmm. And then I think I, even the letters, I even blow the 200% up to 200. So it's like 400% on the lettering. I got to figure out a more, a less, less labor intensive uh, process, but. Is it hand lettering? Is, are you doing? Yeah. Hand? Yeah. I do hand lettering. Yeah. But I mean, I kind of cheat because I like I type everything uh, and then I just paste it down to, and then I ink it. So it'll look like my, you know, it's. It looks like yeah. handwriting. It's got the feeling of handwriting. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, if I were if I were just trying to freehand it, it would be a nightmare, you know, and I've never learned to use those little pencil rule things that, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. I don't even know if they make them anymore, but, you know, I've been given a couple by, by friends of mine and I still can never, I never have been able to ever figure out how the fuck to use those things. <laughs> the Ames lettering guide. Yes. Those ones. I, yeah. I used it for years. Um, until, did you? Oh, wow. Yeah, That's I amazing. did. I used it for years and then I, um, and I, I liked the way my lettering looked using it, but I ended up um, creating a font and now yeah. my own lettering. And now I just use that. Um, yeah it works fine um but at some time i i think i might go back and try to change it again um, yeah you know, sometimes i'm not ha happy with the lettering and i mean it looks okay yeah. but at the same time yeah maybe i could do it better so right right yeah anyway, uh well lance this has been a lot of fun this has been great yeah it's been great you know and uh and check into your work and find out what's going on and i'm i'm really looking forward to this book and congratulations on limerature 101 oh, thank you i hope it does well, you know i should say also i am working on a sequel called limer flicks oh yeah uh, and uh, i have one i i can read to you uh, it's yeah. for dr dr strange love okay um, with its powerful payload aboard the bomber misguidedly soared Com combine lack of compunction with erectile dysfunction and mutual destructions assured. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny. That's what, it, of course, and that is a great summation of that film, um, which is one of the greatest films ever, ever made by somebody who yeah. made several of the greatest films ever made. Stanley Kubrick uh, and the wonderful Peter Sellers and Slim Pickens. Boy, that image is embedded in my brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget George C. Scott, who's oh yeah, uh, George C. Scott is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I mean they're all. It's a great cast and it's a great film and uh, really again one very timely. Uh, yeah, very always very important. Uh, you know, satire has its place, right? You know, it's like yeah, for, yeah. 
can skewer the the moment. But it reminds me of what Dennis Kitchen said about satire, where he was quoting somebody, and it's like satire is what you know closes the theater on Saturday night or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Opens and closes <laughs> on Saturday night. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, well, best of luck with that. That's great. So they're going to publish that. That that book's going to well, be well. Hopefully, yeah. He says, yeah. He says he says he's interested. So I would love to see your cartoons in the as the illustrations. Um, in the next one. Yeah, you sent me that picture uh, uh, of some of the authors that are in this book. Uh, I've got to open my iPad to pull it up now. And oh, in a more cartoony there. way. Yeah, in a more cartoony way, and I just love them. And you know, I enjoy the drawings here. But by golly, I would love to see, you know, what you do with the cartoons, because I'm looking at, well, I've, here's Hemingway and, and James Joyce and John Updike uh, and Norman Mailer. And then I don't know who the other guy is. Um, it looks uh, like Oh, oh, oh as a William Faulkner. William Faulkner. OK, yeah, it, it is William Faulkner. I can see that now. I mean, I, I just love I love all of these. these oh, things. thank you. I would love to see you do it. Do that with it. Um just my yeah, own. maybe, maybe, you know, I'm taking a different approach to this one. So maybe I will. I think I'm going to draw scenes from the movie. So oh. maybe I'll do it in that in that style instead. Yeah, of, I, it's not going to I don't think it's going to have the uh, academic kind of, uh, you know, I don't know. It's early, so I'm not sure. But I don't think it's going to be done like a course syllabus or anything like that. So, you know, might yeah. be a totally different look. Yeah, well, I uh, that would be great. You know, I mean, this is great. It's wonderful. But um, I felt like I got lance hansen in the writing but i really wanted lance hansen in the art too oh yeah i'm sorry <laughs> well that's okay it's, it's all right because these are beautiful portraits but it's just it was just kind of i love your cartoons so much that and i'm such a big fan of those that uh i would love to uh i love seeing what you did here you know with that image you sent me so anyway just my own two cents um going forward but anyway well lance it's been great to have you uh thank I'm you thank thanks for having me it's been great talking so there you have it, uh, Lance Hansen and myself. And I hope you will check out Lance's work at LanceHansenIllustration.com because I think you will not be disappointed. Uh, it's terrific, terrific stuff. Offbeat, uh, eccentric, interesting work as well as very, sometimes very poignant and sometimes very forceful and very funny uh, at the same time. All of that rolled up into one ball. So how can you go? How can you lose? Right. And definitely pick up Limerature 101 uh, and and ask for the second volume <laughs> at your local bookstore or order it from humorousbooks.com or Amazon. Terrific stuff. Wonderful. A lot of fun. I love limericks. I really do. And, uh, you know, Edward Lear, uh, great great limericist is that what we call them anyway I, it's a forgotten art form it's like one of those forms that we don't think about uh it's out there in the world but we don't think about it too often but they really are limericks are a lot of fun and uh more i'm glad lance is doing something with them uh i, I wish i wish we could we saw them more often but here we go this is a wonderful collection uh next up is jan stive or Jan Stivey, Jan Stive. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce Jan's name. Nor great Norwegian cartoonist of Dunce, the comic strip, Norwegian comic strip that's made inroads into the United States uh, through social media and elsewhere. And I've been familiar with his work for a number of years. I hope you have too. Dunce is just a hilarious, hilarious comic strip. And it's so, oh man, the drawing, you can just drink up the ink, you know, off of his, his drawing. I mean, it's, it's exquisite, his line. It's just, oh man, just, I'm looking through his new book. It's called Arctic Tales. And this is on Amazon. It's 1999 paperback. Uh, and, you know, you should definitely check it out. It's got some great recommendations from people like Scott Kurtz and Will Henry. Uh, and y you're going to you're going to love it. It's hilarious. And it's about it's really kind of an autobiographical thing, although it's such as it is when you're a cartoonist and uh, cartoonist and his dog. So uh, it's it's easy to get into. And it is it is hilarious. And it's the drawing is to die for. Cartooning is to die for. I just could I could, like I said, you know, you just pour that ink all over me. It's great. <laughs> I, love, I love the line. Um, so that's next time. I'm talking with him this coming week. So I'm hoping that I'll have another show for you in about 10 days, maybe even less. So uh, we'll try to get back on track with this show. In the meantime, I'm doing some I, some interesting things. You might follow me. Follow me uh, on uh, 
uh, Grogan Jeff on Instagram at Grogan Jeff G R O G A N G E O F F or at Green Screen Comic. Uh, you can follow me there. And what I'm working on right now, I just did a Kickstarter, a uh, very modest Kickstarter that was successful for their Make 100 initiative in January. And it's it was just came out of the blue. I wasn't going to do anything, and it just came up. And it's called The Donut and the Cheeseburger, or actually Donut and the Cheeseburger. There's no the donut. It's just donut. And literally, it's a comic strip about the upcoming election, uh, presidential election, and the election year, and all this stuff. And you can guess who's who, <laughs> if you want to. Uh, and every pretty much every week, I do a full-page comic uh, that's showing up. And I don't know if I'll get through... Um, the, this Kickstarter was for like a publication of 20 pages, uh, uh, and it's going to be a tabloid newspaper, and I'll be publishing it probably in March or April to fulfill the Kickstarter. And so that'll cover half of the year, uh, the election year. And then I don't know, you know, if, if, it's, if there's interest, I might continue, or if I'm interested, I might continue uh, through the remainder of the year. It, it depends. How far can you push that kind of uh, analogy, or what is it exactly? Is it a euphemism? What, what is it when you have like a, uh, you know, the cheeseburger standing in for one person and the donut standing in for another? I don't know. It's, it's, I can't, somebody help me with that. Anyway, uh, so I'm having fun with it right now. And uh, I think it is funny. It's challenging. It's interesting. It's topical. Uh, and uh, we'll see. Uh, will I continue it and publish a second, you know, volume at the end of the year? I might. Um, I have no idea. I have so many projects I want to do right now uh, that I, I originally hadn't planned to do this at all. It's just like a, a detour. and uh, But it is it has been really interesting to do. And I've always been interested in politics. And if you've, you know, if you read any of Plastic Baby Heads or you read any of uh, Jetpack Jr., it all got involved with politics. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm, I'm, I lean left all the way. So you know what to expect uh, in, in this particular take on the presidential election. Anyway, you can follow it on Green Screen Comic or on Grogan Jeff and on Instagram. That's where I do it. And we'll see if I publish the second half. Uh, you know, if the wrong guy gets elected, we may not have the chance to have that kind of um, alternative voice uh, in the future. I don't know. But um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed and... And working resistance in my little way through through this little narrative that I'm creating. Nevertheless, that's that's what's on the drawing board right now, uh, and I hope you'll check it out at Green Screen Comic or at Grogan Jeff, one or the other. Uh, and again, don't forget check out Lance's work at Lance Hansen Illustration. dot com. And if you want. A little hint of what's to come next time. Check out Dunce Comic on Instagram. You can uh, catch up with Jan Stivey's work uh, there on on Dunce Comic on Instagram. So look for that there. Well, I've taken up enough of your time, I guess, and it's uh, about time for me to to go. I've got a brand new puppy I got to go play with, so uh, uh, got to do that. And uh, and again, um, you can get my comics uh, if you're interested in purchasing anything uh, on Etsy at Comics Print Works uh, on Etsy. That's the name of the shop, Comics Print Works. And you can find all kinds of things there, uh, prints, posters. Um, also, the last few comics I published, uh, Green Screen and Captain Daiquiri Jones and the Space Rockettes. So those are available there as well as some of my older stuff. So uh, if you're looking for my work, that's where you can find it. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll, that's about it for now. So I will see you next time. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.